Just one of the DM's many tasks is to be a biased referee. They balance the game, but they are ultimately on the player's side. So in many cases, they tip the scales ever so slightly in the party's favor. But what happens when the DM sees exactly one player and dedicates himself to making it impossible for that player to enjoy the game? If this sounds like a railroaded train wreck, it's because it is. Roll post. This is the tale of my first D&D campaign, and it almost made me give up on D&D entirely. All players involved were first-timers. I knew about D&D for years at the time. I hadn't played yet, but I got a golden opportunity to learn the hobby. The party was five of us players. I was playing a half-elf vengeance paladin who used a shield and a short sword. The game had a strong start at level 3, a typical tavern start with a talking three-legged black cat named Salem acting as our first quest giver, only to be interrupted by an orc raid on the city. From there, it was typical D&D. The DM had a good mixture of comedy and more serious moments, not to mention he did a fantastic job at visual descriptions. By all accounts, the DM put the effort into his sessions, and he had some aspects that made him a great DM. But, what happened at level 5 is where the game took a turning point for the worst. At level 5, we faced an incredibly difficult fight against a high-level sword bard who cast a strange spell, which created a tiny, glistening, floating bead that hovered in the air. My paladin, unsure of what it was, yelled, Everyone move away! I will protect you! My character disengaged and attempted to body block the bead with my shield. The rest of the party spent that turn repositioning to the other side of the room. The Barbarian threw javelins, the Warlock casted firebolts, the Rogue shot arrows, and the Cleric cast a guiding bolt. While the other players unleashed a flurry of attacks, just before my turn started, my character and I learned what a delayed blast fireball was. In an eruption of flames and a visible shockwave, my paladin spectacularly failed their saving throw. The Barbarian, just scraping the edge of the AoE, evaded due to their danger sense. Thanks to his resistance and success on the save, the Barbarian was badly hurt, but pulled through. I, on the other hand, fared significantly less well, taking 62 fire damage to the face, instantly knocking my paladin unconscious. At the time, with how the DM described it, I thought it was fair only to be knocked unconscious considering that I was at the epicenter of the explosion. It was a big moment. The party now realized the threat of the encounter, followed by the cleric complaining that she had to heal the stupid paladin again, which the others laughed about. The DM said, well, he's not dead yet, so you don't have to heal him immediately. The cleric opted to charge forward, swinging her greatsword in thunderous fury. The fight ended up being a slog. I was lifeless on the ground, only able to watch on as the rest of the party fought the bard. The fight went on for a few more rounds. After reducing the bard to zero hit points, he entered his final form. Flames erupted from him. They swirled around the bard. Our party's attacks couldn't hurt him. Then, the DM did something pretty cool. On my turn, as I was about to roll another death save, the DM said I regained consciousness. The first thing I saw above me was the bard, as he was standing directly over me. Being directly below him, I was the only one who could see under his shirt. Embedded in his belly was an amber gemstone that radiated power. I attempted to rip it out. It was a success. The DM went on to an epic description of how the seemingly dead paladin suddenly erupted, sending his metal gauntlet into Bard's abdomen and ripping out an amber gemstone. The Bard screamed in pain. He screamed, no, it can't end now, as all the flames halted from his corpse hitting the floor. At the same time, the DM described how my character fell back unconscious only for the cleric to cast Spare the Dying on me. This is the exact moment the train wreck began. After my character awoke, I was brought up to speed and the party completed a long rest, at which point the DM said, Paladin. As you awake, you feel your faith diminished, and no longer feel the fresh comfort of divinity each morning brings. 
you do not recover any spell slots, uses of Lay on Hands, or uses of your channel divinity. Me. Um, okay, do I know why? The DM said no. I was new and didn't fully understand the rules, so I thought it was an effect of being knocked out back to back in a rough encounter. The day went on. It was alright for the rest of the party, but rough for me. As the day ends and we long rest, the DM tells me that I feel no different. I still recover hit points and hit dice, but I'm also still nerfed. At this point, I'm concerned. I only have a couple level 1 spell slots and 5 lay on hand points, so I talk to my party and the cleric players suggest I go to church. Now, this was the first and only time the DM had messed with any of the players' characters by taking stuff away from them. From the beginning to the very end, I was the only one who had stuff taken away from them at all. After the following session, I had a conversation with the DM. Hey, what's going on with my character? It feels a little bit targeted. Oh, it is a little, but trust me, it's for story reasons. I'm letting the others shine now, but you're going to have a bigger part of the story later. Okay, well, what happens with my character now? Find out next session. There will be a town with a church to your god. First, I want to say that I understand the DM urge to take stuff away from the players as a way to motivate them into action. I won't tell you not to because it can work. But there is one warning you should probably know. Remember that the party is playing a game. The primary goal of the game is to have fun. So you should ask yourself if taking the thing away from them makes the game less fun. If that's true, strongly reconsider it. You can take away certain items, titles, NPCs, stuff like that, and if you do it correctly you will motivate the players into action, not discourage them from even trying. Where were we? The nonsensical BS. We arrive at the big city where I let the party know my intention to seek a cleric of my faith. The cleric says that she will watch over me while the rest of the party explores the town. The church was a grim place, a gothic atmosphere run by an elderly man with a gaunt face, aged by the tax of time. After explaining the situation to him, he offers to perform a ceremony to contact our shared god. The DM went all out for this description, from describing swirling black smoke to rolling his eyes back in person as he acted it out. At the apex of the ritual, the priest said, After you fell in battle, our shared god believed you to have died as you were so close to death. As such, he no longer is giving you divine power. So, how can I get him to see me again? Can you contact him? That is out of my power, child. Instead, you should bolster your faith and perform acts of heroism. Keep to the tenets of your oath and uphold your faith, and it is a certainty that he will restore his divine gifts. Not wanting to cause a scene, I was annoyed, but I went with it as I imagined the DM was using this as a test of faith moment in the story, despite finding the whole concept nonsensical. I was a vengeance paladin of Kelimvor, Lord of the Dead and Judge of the Damned. He who judges all in the City of the Dead. So, do you see the problem here? The God of Death believes one of his devotees that he's giving power to, to be dead. When that paladin fails to manifest in the afterlife for judgment, instead of seeking me out or judging me or confirming if I'm dead, he just takes away my paladin powers. This is just hard to watch. The DM lined up something really cool and then dashed it in the very next sentence. Being forgotten by the gods could open a cool plot point depending on how you define gods, but no matter how they're defined, the god of death had one job. How exactly did he let one of his devotees slip from his grasp? But you know what? I'm okay with this actually. DMs are allowed to leave plot holes behind, they don't have a writer's room, they probably have a job. It's okay for things to not make total sense. The part where I have a problem is that the only direction the DM gave OP was to just be nice and wait for his powers to come back. There's no mission, it's unfulfilling, unmotivating, if it serves any purpose it's doing it wrong because it alienates one of the players. 
it doesn't leave the paladin with any course of action that they can follow. This tells me that the DM either doesn't know or doesn't care that he sucks. After reuniting, we leave the city and go out adventuring for a bit, where I decide to not expend any spell slots. This was painful. Then, after a couple of sessions, the DM declares a level up. Everyone is hyped at the table, looking at what they get, ecstatic at what they can do now. I then turn to the DM and ask, at this level, I would normally get an Aura of Protection. What happens since I'm missing spell slots? The DM was prepared with a response. Increase your hit point maximum, gain a hit dice, and increase your total spell slot limit if that increases. However, you won't recover any spell slots or gain these. And you don't get your Aura of Protection. What about Lay on Hands? It's five times level. That maximum increases, but you don't recover any. This left me in a foul mood, but I left it as I didn't want to bring the rest of the player's mood down, since they were so excited about their new class features. Sessions pass by and we reach another level up. I still don't have my powers back. At this point, I asked if I could multi-class into a cleric as a representation of my character trying to strengthen their faith. Plus, getting some spell slots back would be nice. The DM says that's great, but once I choose to do so, I can't undo it. So, I agreed. It was at this point the DM was kind enough to inform me that I would not be gaining any recoverable resources from the cleric. Me. That's kind of a dick move, you know? DM. It's how your character's operating. Plus, you have cantrips now. You wouldn't have gained anything from Paladin anyway. That's only because you took it away from my character. Stop being so ungrateful. I already told you I was doing it for story reasons. Then the Warlock chimed in. Stop complaining, Paladin. Your class has more features and hit points than me. And you have better armor. Barbarian also said, I can't wear armor either. Plus, you get a fighting style. I don't get that. <sighs> Sorry, guys. Don't look so glum. You're basically a fighter now. I don't understand the utility of taking everything away from the paladin. I also don't understand how the rest of the party doesn't see how badly he's getting boned here. Then again, they are first time players. Maybe they're too focused on themselves and learning their characters, especially given how frequently they're leveling up. This could be too much of a benefit of the doubt, but I don't know, maybe we can leave the door open for that, maybe not, doesn't matter. Will any other party members call this out? Let's keep rolling. The session continues, where we learn that Salem was a Rakshasa, and we learn of the big bad evil guy who is an ancient vampire attempting to gather seven gems which seal his true power. One of them being the amber gemstone I ripped out of the bard. Salem gives us a shortcut through a layer of hell where we find ourselves on a giant glacier, with no way down but to climb. The barbarian uses his athletics to climb down with ease. The rogue uses her acrobatics to vault and twist down, grabbing onto small parts with her greater dexterity. The warlock polymorphs the cleric into a bird to fly down, then to herself and changes back once. She's at the bottom. The DM then bears an evil grin as he says, Paladin, you're in heavy armor. This will be a much more difficult climb down, and you will have disadvantage. Could I stick my short sword in the ice and repel down the ice like a pirate does on a ship sail, since my armor is so heavy? The ice is too solid for that. Okay, I cast Searing Smite on my short sword. You're not recovering spell slots right now. Spell slots that I never expended. Not falling to my death seems like a good use. How could a smite help you? Flames cover a weapon you can touch until you hit it with an attack. Since I'm not attacking, the ice sword remains covered in the flames. Therefore, it should help me melt the ice. Huh. That's creative. Sure, I'll allow it. With the party safely down, we begin our march across a frozen lake, Midway through, the DM asks for everyone to make a saving throw, which the Barbarian fails. He vanishes and we hear a thudding below us. As we look down, we see him fully trapped in ice. The Barbarian is not strong enough to break free. 
while the rest of the party is failing to destroy the ice. The warlock is making the most progress with the firebolt, but it's not enough as the barbarian is running out of time. With a heavy heart, I cast Searing Smite, brandishing my short sword in flames. Like a warm knife through butter, I cleave my way enough to free the barbarian. With that, I'm now out of spell slots. This was a painfully obvious plot by the DM to run him out of spell slots, for whatever reason. But what's even weirder was the glacier incident. What was the DM's plan if the paladin failed his disadvantaged role? Was he just gonna kill off the character, or take even more stuff away? I feel like there's something we don't yet understand about their relationship. Do these guys hate each other? Who hurt the DM? Was it OP? Even then, it doesn't matter. If he didn't like this guy, why was he invited? It doesn't make sense to target this guy whether they have beef or not. There are so many questions and not really any answers. It's just not adding up. My suffering continues as we unravel more of the story. Fights get progressively more painful as the DM throws enemies that are resistant to non-magical damage. We begin leveling faster and faster, once every two or three sessions. Around level 9, the DM starts throwing undead at us, which are immune to non-magical damage. Finally, I have a good use for one of my only available spells. I cast Toll the Dead. And then the game stops. The DM says that these undead are immune to Toll the Dead. I spend the rest of the game getting to know how fun it is spending entire fights only using the help action. We keep leveling and eventually reach level 12. I haven't even mentioned yet that every other session I would ask the DM the same question. Am I still wanted in the campaign? Do you want me to change characters? Mine really sucks, I feel like a pleb standing next to walking demigods. We will get into it soon. It will be so good for the story. I have so much planned and you will ruin it if you leave. Just stop being so spoiled and bear with it. The other players seem to be on the DM's side. Whenever I talk to them about leaving, they would go on about how they wanted me to stay at the table. At this point, the other players had a whole host of magic items. Several items per person. The only special item I had was a set of plate armor which allowed me to use my reaction to throw myself in front of an ally within 5 feet of me when they were attacked. This would be neat if I didn't already have the protection fighting style, and if you didn't already know, it does the same exact thing. Meaning, this totally invalidated my fighting style. A few sessions after using both, I had the following conversation outside of the game. Hey DM, I appreciate the magic armor, but its feature kind of invalidated my fighting style. Could I switch my fighting style? I don't mind if my character has to do extra training, or maybe my character has to seek a teacher or something. Hmm, no. You picked what you picked. The warlock doesn't get to change their pact. And now, the sword that broke the paladin's back. The adventure continues, and it's been horrific for me. Only being able to cast Toll the Dead, which the enemies are resistant to, hurts me. At this time, I failed to find any other D&D. I was isolated at university, and life generally wasn't that great. I kept telling myself that this D&D is getting me to socialize and get out of the house. No, because what people don't understand is that loneliness is much more than just an unpleasant experience. It's way more serious. They act like the Crab King doesn't remember, but humans evolved to be social. If someone is not interacting with other people in a meaningful way, regularly, they are denying themselves something that they evolved to require. People treat socialization like it's just an option, when really it's a necessity. Which is why it doesn't surprise me at all that the socially starved are easily influenced by people so long as they're getting a baseline level of human interaction, even negative attention. That's why it makes perfect sense to me why OP stayed with the group this long. 
just leaving the group could be terrifying to someone who doesn't have anybody else. We end up facing the Undead Knight, which the DM described as wielding a magic longsword. We battle and eventually defeat said knight. I ask if I can recover the sword, and the DM says yes. When we long rest, the DM informs me that I feel a spark of divinity as I recover a first level spell slot. The rest of the players are hyping it up, and they're happy. After all this time, after all these levels, all of these battles spent being near useless, I'm finally getting my powers back. But after everything I've been through, I feel hollow. I'm standing next to near demigods who can literally summon 100 blades from thin air. And here I am with what? One first level spell slot? I was mad at the DM for the whole story, but now that we know more about OP and what he's going through, I'm almost enraged. This is a classic case of too little too late. It's like he's drip feeding the paladin powers he should have had a long time ago. It's like that because it is that. It doesn't matter that he got some powers back. If we track the whole party's progression over this campaign, comparatively speaking, he's even deeper in the shadow of his fellow party members than he was when he first lost his powers. I identify the sword. It's a plus one long sword with some dark unknown property to it. The next day, we face two vampire spawn knights. Having killed one of them before, we knew its resistance, and with my new magic sword in hand, I was finally ready to deal some damage. The initiative is rolled, and I'm up first. Brandishing my new blade in hand, I barrel towards the enemy and roll an attack. Natural 20. Everyone's hyped, and I feel the joy starting to come back. I grin and proclaim, I would like to smite. I roll damage, the DM narrates. The reinvigorated divine power builds in your chest as it flows down your arm onto the blade, becoming a searing radiance. As the radiance builds up, it burns the undead, rendering its flesh to dust. At this point, you hear a cracking noise. Glancing at your blade, you can only watch as it shatters into dozens of pieces, <laughs> becoming useless. What? At the end of a long rest, the blade will repair itself. Also, it takes an action to change your weapon. That undead has immunity to my attacks. Without that sword, I can't deal damage to these enemies. Well, you will have to be more tactical when you decide to smite. At this point, I start packing up my stuff. I'd had enough. I said, the DM can kill my character for all I care. I don't care about your story anymore. I tried to work with you, but all this has done is make me a dead weight. At the time, the DM attempted to rebuttal and convince me to stay. The Rogue and the Barbarians players said that they liked hanging out with me, but I wouldn't hear it. I left the table. The Barbarian player followed me. He wanted to talk. We talked for a while. I explained what I was going through and how this was seriously bothering me, and I just couldn't deal with feeling useless five hours a week as I watch everyone else be heroes. The Barbarians player offered to look after me and walk me back to my place. I refused and said that it was a bit late for this sentiment. You didn't speak out against the DM's treatment of me, and you only intervened right as I'm having a breakdown. There are two perspectives here, and I really want to know what the commenters think about this, because I'm not really sure how I feel just yet. On one hand, it's sometimes hard to notice people who aren't you. In the beginning of the story, it said that all of them were new players, so I can understand why they might have hang-ups against calling out the much more experienced DM. On the other hand, OP brought this up several times, all the players could see how useless his character was, and the DM wasn't even trying to hide it. How could they not notice this? And then, even if they didn't notice it at first, how could they back up the DM whenever OP mentioned this? In the beginning of the story, it said all of them were new, and it seems like the players, particularly the Barbarian, genuinely care about OP. But just like the DM, they gave too little too late. I just walked away. Not my finest moment, I will admit, 
I burnt a lot of bridges that day and never really spoke to those players again. I saw the Barbarian in person once more and I apologized to him for how we left it and we both agreed to just go our separate ways. This experience almost made me quit D&D, but someone who would later become my best friend offered to DM for me. To say I was hesitant was an understatement, but the DM helped me make a changeling warlock. Help. He helped me min-max it because he wanted me to experience playing a powerful character. That character was a blast to play, but the campaign did die. Afterwards, he offered me a spot in a different campaign, where we rocked up a level 6 Lizardfolk Spore Druid. Well, two years later, Lizardfolk is now level 16 with the game ongoing and I'm wrapping up my third game as a DM. When you're socially starved, it's very easy for people to take advantage and treat you poorly because you don't have anybody else. It's a hard thing to do, but I am so proud of you for putting your foot down and standing up for yourself. I'm so glad to hear a happy ending. All of us crabs are very excited to have you back in the hobby. Also, while we're at the end of the video, we've kind of been killing it with upload consistency. From now on, I upload every Wednesday. We are so back, and as always, till next time.